to form, flex, and bend around us all the time. In this episode of Compliant Mechanism Design, I'm going to point out some common everyday examples of compliant items that use elastic deformation to function. And you may be surprised just how many flexible things impact your life on a daily basis. I'm Professor Hopkins, and you're watching The Facts of Mechanical Design. Long before recorded history, early humans recognized the importance of things that elastically deform and used compliance to help them survive. Although no one knows exactly who invented the first bow and arrow, archaeological evidence suggests that they were used in Africa as early as 62,000 BC during the Middle Stone Age. By deforming an elastic bow, Using an arrow loaded against a taut string, early humans discovered that they could rapidly convert the bow's deformation energy into the arrow's kinetic energy and thereby launch the arrow with substantially more speed and accuracy than could be achieved by simply throwing the arrow by hand. If you consider the impact this ancient invention had on our ancestors' ability to hunt and defend themselves, it's reasonable to conclude that humanity itself may owe much of its continued survival to compliant inventions like the bow. The art that decorates the walls of some Egyptian tombs even shows that bows were used for other purposes beyond hunting and war. This piece from the tomb of Rikamir depicts Egyptians using a bow to drill holes in beads by wrapping the tension string of the bow around sticks and then quickly rotating the sticks by moving the bow back and forth. Bellows is another ancient compliant invention that had a hand in dramatically accelerating human progress. It's interesting to recognize that historians named the major periods of history, such as the Bronze and Iron Ages, according to the materials that enabled the technological advances of the time. The discovery and production of those important metals were made possible by bellows, which relied on the elastic deformations of a flexible diaphragm to supply fires with sufficient oxygen for achieving temperatures hot enough to smelt ore and extract the molten metal for making tools and weapons. This artwork, also found in Rikamir's tomb, depicts an ancient bellows design, which consisted of a stone pot with an open top onto which an elastic leather casing was stretched. Strings, or sticks, were used to pull the casing upwards, which sucked air into the expanding chamber inside the pot. The elastic casing was then released and stepped on to forcefully push the air into a furnace and thus feed its fire with the necessary oxygen for producing the metals on which the ancient cultures so heavily relied. So, if compliant technologies such as bows and bellows had such an impact on our ancestors' ability to survive and thrive in the world they lived in, what effect do compliant technologies have on our lives today? Well, before I spring into that discussion, let me first define what compliance even is before we get ahead of ourselves with examples. To understand what compliance is, it's helpful to first understand what stiffness is since they are closely related principles. Stiffness is the extent to which a body resists deformation in response to an applied load. More specifically, 
A body exhibits stiffness when it resists an applied load with a counter force that is a function of how much the body is displaced by the applied load. Now, I understand that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll break it down with a visual. Suppose I grab a spring by its top and slowly apply a load by pulling on it with a force F measured in units of newtons. If the other end of the spring is held fixed, the spring will deform away from its original equilibrium position and attempt to resist the load by pulling back on the spring's top in the opposite direction with another force, F resist. And here's the important point. The reason that the spring exhibits stiffness is because that resisting force is dependent on how much the spring has displaced. So, in terms of math, F resist is a function of the displacement distance X, which is measured in units of meters. If the spring is a linear spring, the resisting force F resist will be linearly proportional to the spring's displacement X according to a constant K, which is the spring's stiffness. In other words, if the spring's top displaces a distance x, the magnitude of the force that the linear spring will exert on its top to resist this displacement, f resist, equals the spring's stiffness k multiplied by its displacement x. We need to include a negative sign in the equation, though, because the resisting force will always point in the opposite direction of the displacement vector that points from the spring's undeformed position to where it has been displaced as depicted by the black arrow. So, if the spring displaces up with a positive x value, F resist will point down in the opposite direction with a negative value to resist that displacement. Note that according to principles of static equilibrium, the force of the applied load F will always be equal in magnitude, but point in the opposite direction to the spring's resisting force, F resist, as long as the spring is loaded quasi-statically. That means very slowly, so that no dynamics come into play and no other forces such as gravity are present or relevant. Under such conditions, we find that these equations can be combined to determine that the applied load F equals the spring stiffness K multiplied by how much the spring displaces x according to the famous equation F equals kx. Thus, if I pull on the spring with a small force, the spring will stretch a small amount. But if I pull on the spring with a large force, the spring will stretch a large amount. Essentially, the more I deform a linear spring, the more it will attempt to resist my load with an ever-increasing force and consequently, the more force I will need to impart on the spring to deform it that amount. Springs that can be modeled using the equation F equals kx are said to be linear because their stiffness k remains a constant and unchanging value over their full range of deformation. Consequently, if their loading force F is plotted against their corresponding displacement x, the resulting load path is a straight line. Such springs will move up and down along this line as they are loaded and unloaded because of their inherent elasticity. Thus, springs that deform in this way are said to be linear elastic springs. Note that the slope of a linear elastic spring's load path line is the spring stiffness K, which is measured in units of newtons per meter, and according to calculus, is the derivative of the force F with respect to the displacement X. Thus, the stiffer the spring is, the steeper its slope, which means that it takes a larger change in force to displace the spring a smaller amount. Finally note that all the previous principles discussed hold true for linear elastic springs when they are also loaded by negative compressive forces and thus displace in the negative direction from their undeformed position. Now, there's a lot that could be said about the principle of stiffness, but no amount of talking or even showing can teach you as much as you could learn through your own experience of just pushing on a spring and feeling how the resisting forces change as you deform the spring different amounts. 
So I strongly encourage you to just find a spring and play with it. Once you feel like you have a good grasp on what stiffness is, you're ready to understand compliance. Compliance is essentially the opposite of stiffness. Mathematically speaking, a spring's compliance C is the inverse of its stiffness K. This means that the stiffer a spring is, the less compliant it is, and the less stiff a spring is, the more compliant it is. So, compliant springs deform over larger ranges more easily, meaning with less force than stiff springs.